So we've learned quite a bit, haven't we? We've learned about equipment and combat, learned some useful tools and habits, and even learned how to make some useful tools and equipment for combat. So let's say we complicate things, hmm? Let's make a mutant. Mutants are a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. They are so much, in fact, I've decided to split this into two separate parts. Character creation and mutant play. Today we will start at the beginning. Character creation. When I started this series, I wanted to teach some good fundamentals and take out some of the guesswork. So I had you skip character creation. Character creation can be really intimidating when you're just starting out, and ultimately I want to teach you how to enjoy CUD. Now that you've gotten your feet wet with combat, handed in a few quests, and learned some good habits, let's get our hands dirty with making a character. When you start making a character, your first choice is in many ways the most important one. Truekin or Mutant? If we were to liken character creation to painting a picture, I would say true kin are similar to making a black and white painting, and mutants are full color. Keep that idea in your mind as we move forward. Alright, so what do we have? Mutants. Mutations. Aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. Moderate starting attributes versus high starting attributes. What does this mean? True kin starts with 12 points in every stat, before you spend your starting points. Whereas mutants start at 10 in each stat. Mutants actually get more points to spend, however, at 44, where true kin only have 38. The extra 6 points is a consolation prize in this area. The true kin in general have beefier stats. True kin also get more skill points, get more resistances from their point of origin, have a natural ability to turn robots into allies, and start on neutral ground with the Pewtis Templar. Pewtis Templar being the genocidal faction that dabbles in Eater Tonics, the god's nectar which increases all of your base attributes. Plus, true kin gain access to cybernetics, the ability to become, be part machine, replace your weak flesh with sturdy jet black steel, transcend your puny vessel. Wow, true kin are looking pretty good, right? Mm, let's move forward. I'm going to skip stats for the time being because, counterintuitively, it is good to know a bit about the mutant you're building before you start slapping down attributes. So, mutations. There's 70 of them. That's a lot. But... I'm here to demystify the situation a little bit. Remember, building a mutant is much like making a full color painting. Your mutations are your colors. They range in hue and values. Hues and values are easy to organize, and once you start to see their color, you'll know how to mix them. Let's talk about morphotypes. Chimera, Esper, Unstable Genome. Setting aside Unstable Genome, Chimera and Esper limit your build to either physical or mental mutations kind of like limiting you to warm or cold palettes. Before we continue here, I should mention that Chimera has a secret ability that allows you to grow extra limbs. This is kind of a double-edged blade, but I'll talk about this later. Espers are also a double-edged blade, but I'll also talk about that later. Unstable Genome is the only mutation you can take multiple times. It basically gives nothing now, but with the promise of something later. This can be a nice way to spice up your game and take some of the burden of choice out of your hands. It also has the chance of being cost effective, as it can offer you mutations which cost more if you bought them at character creation. Last thing to note here, Unstable Genome works with Chimera and Esper, in that when you do eventually get your mutations, they will be limited to the morphotype you picked. Alright, so let's get our tendrils dirty with some mutations. First, when buying mutations, you should pay attention to a couple of key details. What is scalable? What is the cooldown? Physical or mental? When reading the details for a mutation, whatever is highlighted in blue is scalable, meaning that this is what improves as you level up the mutation. You're going to want to be aware of cooldown. Though the cooldown amount does vary with your willpower, the screen will always display the same cooldown amount. It's good to know how often you're going to be using an ability in combat. If you didn't pick a genotype and plan on mixing physical and mental mutations, a totally valid thing by the way, keep a few things in mind. Physical mutations will tend to synergize with physical traits. Traits, mind you, and not just other physical mutations. Conversely, mental mutations tend to synergize with other mental mutations. Mutations, mind you, as there really aren't any mental traits outside of your ego. So when you're considering mental and physical mutations, consider them as your primary color, with the other being complementary. If you're going high strength toughness build and you want to build primarily physical mutations, a mental mutation can help, but don't plan for it to be what carries you. If you're putting a lot of points into ego to make that brain-busting god character, a physical mutation can help round things out, but won't close the gap that your missing strength makes. 
There's a lot of mutations and I'm not going to break them all down. Instead, I'm going to attempt to organize this list a little bit so that when you're making your choices, you understand a bit better what works together. Mutations can be broken down into a few categories. Weapon, attack, support, escape, frill. Let's break these categories down, and as we do, I will list the mutations underneath. Please take note, some mutations toe the line between certain categories, so they may show up in multiple categories. Weapon mutations. These are mutations which provide you with a weapon, or an attack, with a fairly low cooldown. Having a natural weapon is a powerful thing for a couple of reasons. With burrowing claws as an exception, most natural weapons take a non-standard weapon slot. For instance, the head. This frees up your hands to hold more weapons. These all give you a physical weapon to work with. If you build around these weapons, they can become pretty powerful, or at least become extra passive damage in combat. You will want to make use of dual wielding to get the most out of these weapons. And if you want to use them as your primary weapon, you will need to pump a lot of mutation points into them to keep up with the armor of your enemies. More on mutation points later. This actually makes weapon mutations quite needy, as you need to focus them quite a lot in order for them to become viable. Attack mutations. These are mutations which give you a singular attack in your arsenal. Attack mutations are kind of like your flintlock pistol, if you'll excuse the weirdly specific reference for a moment. What I mean is you can fire these off, and they will certainly hurt or kill, but with generally high cooldowns. They are very much a one and done attack, like a flintlock. Like a flintlock, it's a good thing to have a couple of these so that you can fire one off after the other. Support mutations. These are mutations which don't necessarily give you an ability to attack with, but instead support your other traits. These traits can include your attacks, physical or mental, or even your other attack mutations. Or they can even support each other. Do not overlook support mutations. Some of these can do a lot to lift up your other abilities, even as far as to ascend your run from mediocre to fully chrome. Please note, there are a couple of physical mutations which can support an esper run, and a couple of mental mutations which can support a physical run. Escape mutations. As the name implies, these mutations will give you an ability useful for leaving a potentially dangerous conflict. These make for pretty useful panic buttons if things turn sour, which can make the difference between life and death. Frills. These are low point bias which tend to add a little bit of character to your, um, character. Some of these are actually quite powerful, and could be considered support, but none of them really improve anything dramatically. Think of these like the cherry, an unnecessary flourish, but still appreciated. Okay, so now that we have an idea how to perceive a mutation, how do we put this all together and make a mutant? Decide what your primary is, mental or physical. Physical? When it comes to stats, consider pumping up strength, agility, willpower, toughness. When I say pump up, by the way, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about this. You will build your attributes up as you play, but it's a pretty dangerous move to shortchange your other attributes and put all of your eggs in one basket. A light touch will be enough. Pick a nice weapon or attack mutation. Pick a support, which you can see improving your attacks or weapon. Pick an escape. Dump the rest on a frill. Mental? For stats, consider pumping, willpower, toughness, ego. Ego will be really important. Again, we're making sensible choices now. Maybe pick two attacks. Support is not as important as an escape. Having both is good, but if you have to pick, get a nice escape. Dump on frill. Just a note about willpower and ego. Ego is primarily useful to users of mental mutations, but it does come into play with some skills, so ego is not useless to a physical type character. This is more true for willpower as it scales down cooldown on all abilities. This can be really good for a physical type, especially when it comes to cascading chance-based abilities like dismember and decapitate. But what about defects? Yes, defects. Mutations which negatively impact your run in return for extra spending mutation points. You can only pick one, and it will likely be something you need to contend with the entire run. I would say wait until you're a little more familiar with the game, but uh, nah. Also, who am I kidding? You're going to take one anyways. Some defects give you more points than others, but it should be noted that some defects you can more easily mitigate through the run than others. Consider Amphibious, a defect which requires more water. This defect actually gives you rep for frogs, so you could consider it a frill that they pay you to take. Sure, you need more water, but if you consider taking Fasting Way and Mind Over Body in the Self-Discipline Tree, you can completely mitigate this and then some. Compare this to Dystechnia, a defect which makes it harder to examine artifacts and prevents NPCs to examine them for you. 
and adds a chance for artifacts to explode when examination fails. This can actually get you killed in the late game. So to keep things short, not all defects are created equally. Some offer four extra points without so much as a slap on your four wrists, and some are just evil. Okay, so let's recap this whole thing because I know this was a lot by building a couple of characters, and I'll even recommend a couple of mutations and defects. Here's my physical type mutant. I'm going to try and build into cudgels, so I know that strength is my go-to for power. Cudgels have chance-based attacks on hit and a low cooldown attack, conk, at 10 turns. This doesn't have to be part of your decision making, but sometimes it can be fun to build towards a desired synergy. Because I know cudgels have a chance-based stun effect and a low cooldown attack, I'm going to lean into these benefits. I'm going to bump up strength for power, toughness for survivability, and willpower to reduce that cooldown even more. For mutations, I'm going to maximize my chance for stun. Double muscled gives me more strength as well as an extra stacking chance to daze. Multiple arms is going to give me four arms and so therefore four cudgels. And if I raise it up enough, potentially four chances per attack to stun. Temporal fugue is a mental mutation, but a very good one. It's going to create extra copies of myself, all with four arms, all with four cudgels, and all with a chance to stun and daze. We could stop here. This is pretty good, but let me recommend a defect as well. If you have a decent set of mutations and don't foresee yourself wanting more, more on this in the next episode, then Irritable Genome is a good choice as its worst effect is you don't always get to choose which mutation you improve. So we have four points to play with. Let's take Adrenal Control. This will basically let us beast out, charging up all of our mutations. This will mean we have copies, all with improved mutations. For Calling, by the way, I took Greybeard for the extra willpower and Free Cudgel skill. I don't have much to say on callings. Pick the one that makes sense. The one that calls to you, huh? So let me break down a couple of key decisions here. I took a mental mutation. It's a really good one and doesn't necessarily need the extra ego to make this character a killer. The majority of our eggs are where they need to be to make the character work. Also, did you notice I picked all support mutations? Since support mutations support your traits, then that means you can rely on good old fashioned attacks to do the heavy lifting. You do not need to give a mutant an attack mutation or a weapon mutation to be a really decent mutant. This took me a while to figure out, believe it or not. Okay, so Esper. For Esper, I am going to rely on mutation attacks. I'm going to take Apostle for that extra ego and customs and folklore is something I always make use of. I'm going to talk for just a second about area-based attacks. These are attacks you can throw down anywhere in sight, not just line of sight. This includes pyrokinesis, cryokinesis, teleportation, burgeoning, and stunning force. If we take clairvoyance, we can target an area of the map to gain sight over, which means we can attack areas not in our vicinity. Clairvoyance is a really good support skill and not very expensive. I recommend taking it on any character with area-based attacks, but even any Esper can help you plan around hazards and potentially dangerous situations. Let's take clairvoyance, stunning force, and teleportation. It's a good idea to have an escape skill as an Esper since you tend to be a bit squishy in the early game. Now, again, this could be fine. We could spend our last point on a frill or even the Esper genotype and kind of play things by ear, but let me take another defect. Personally, I kind of hate all of the mental defects, so let me recommend another physical one. I find hooks for feet is pretty easy to work around. With the extra points, I'll take another area-based attack. I like cryokinesis. This build means you can't take the Esper genotype, but the extra four points from a defect that doesn't kill you is not a bad thing in my book. These are two pretty good characters in my opinion, though not terribly creative. I'll put the build codes in the description. This was a lot, I get it. Mutants can be intimidating, which is why I started us with True Kin. The thing that took me the longest to understand about mutants is there really isn't a wrong or right way to play them. In the next part, I will build a couple of mutants and we will learn a bit about how to play them as well as how mutation points work. We will also take a quick look at chimeras and espers, their advantages and their disadvantages. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this informative. If you enjoyed it, hit that like button, subscribe, all that business. I'll see you guys next time.